Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different. Each guest is unique. Each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. In today's episode, we continue our exploration of health and healing from the perspective of science and spirituality, as we can't really separate the two, not anymore, I believe. And we will expand this narrative to the concepts of consciousness, biofield, and multidimensional living, my favorite topics. My special guest today is Dr. Shamani Jain, an expert in these fields. Dr. Jane is a psychologist, a scientist, and social profit leader. She has a BA in neuroscience and behavior from Columbia University and a PhD degree from the UC San Diego Joint Doctoral Program in Clinical Psychology with a research focus on psychoneuroimmunology. She is the founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, or CHI, a non-profit collaborative accelerator that connects scientists, health practitioners, educators, and artists to help lead humanity to heal ourselves. Her award-winning research and her presentation of it has been featured in major media including Time, CNN, and Good Day LA, as well as with two TEDx talks on healing and several documentaries. Her award-winning book, Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science and the Future of Health, is available at booksellers worldwide. And now Dr. Jane joins me from South Carolina. Hello, Dr. Jane. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Beautiful. Now, to set the scene for this conversation, could you please share with us your story that has led you onto this path, including the influence of your Indian heritage on your work? Absolutely. Well, I find myself actually in my hometown in Greenville, South Carolina, where I was raised and where I was born. So early on, being born to uh, you know parents of immigrants who had emigrated from India now almost 60 years ago, they were the first Indians in the town actually, uh, being born and raised here in the South, being surrounded by Baptist Christian friends, made me realize at a very early age that we all had different ways of describing our connection to the spiritual. And it was actually very interesting and fun, mostly for me, because my friends, um, being pretty rooted in their faith, you know, I would even go to church with them on occasion, um, were also very deeply curious about our religion and our faith and how we saw the world and viewed it. So right away, I began to realize there are many different ways and paths to understanding our divine nature and our connection with divinity. But I think what was a little more jarring for me, honestly, actually, was going to school and recognizing that many of the things that we might talk about in our spiritual lives or that I might read in spiritual books um, was really just not, didn't really have a place in the school setting. And we understand the separation of church and state and the need for that. There was a, there's a reason why we have those separations. 
And yet what I realized as I continued my schooling was that when we talked about things like health and healing, there seemed to be a big part missing in the picture. So I would go back to these books that I would read as a child that spoke about the practices of yoga. Now this is, you know, in the 1970s when yoga was not considered as evidence-based or popular as it is today. People were doing yoga, of course, in the 70s. But these books that I was reading from these monks would declare the effects of yoga on the central nervous system, <laughs> on the parasympathetic nervous system, the effects of pranayam, which is really literally breathing in life force energy and its effects on the physical body. Now, being the daughter of a scientist, my father is a chemist, and he always said, Shamini, you can understand everything through chemistry and physics. But he had an unshakable belief in the soul as well. So for him, there was no issue. But for me, growing up here in the United States, I began to read these books as someone, you know, trained in the schools here in the Western world. And I said, how do they know that? How can they sit there and say all these things about yoga and life force energy? And yet I could not deny the power of what they were saying from my own experience as a young person, always very deeply tied to sound and singing. I found for myself just singing with joy around the house or learning mantras as we learned in our Jan tradition. There was a real power of vibration that I could feel, but that we didn't talk about at school. We didn't talk about the power of sound. We didn't talk about the power of things like yoga for health and healing. We didn't talk about the power of the spirit or energy. And this kind of continued with me throughout my schooling at Columbia University and in graduate school, and even my first studies in meditation, where I learned quickly in the early 2000s, even though my still my most widely cited scientific study is in meditation. And I have to tell you, Anna, I think it's the most boring study I've ever done. <laughs> it was just a study comparing mindful comprehensive relaxation and a weightless control group. And it was the first of its kind to do that, I guess, which is why it's so cited. But it was very vanilla, you know, to me, it was just asking a very basic question. Is there something unique about mindfulness compared to relaxation? And, you know, having been a practitioner, I said, well, it would make sense that someone who practices mindfulness would engage less in rumination, you know, literally the chewing of our mental cud, right? Thinking about things over and over that if we're really being trained in present moment awareness, it is the reduction in rumination that can drive reduced distress for people who practice mindfulness versus relaxation. Mm. So not a mind blowing hypothesis and it turned out to be true, right? So but what I realized in talking with the researchers in the early 2000s in mindfulness, because I was always interested in contemplative and spiritual practice as a whole, was that you couldn't talk about energy. You couldn't talk about spiritual experiences with these researchers who were, you know, bona fide researchers at major universities. They were scared to talk about this stuff. They didn't want to go there. They would shut down students and shut down people who would talk about the spiritual essence of the practices and this felt sense of energy that many of us felt while we were doing these practices. I found that very disheartening, to be honest, and very curious. And I said, interesting that even in this day and age where mindfulness meditation is taking off in all these ways, we're still scared to talk about the power of the spirit. Yeah. And where I found that people were not scared to talk about these things was in what we call the energy healing work, the biofield. And so it was through my own personal experience with biofield therapies combined with my personal experience with sound where I said, I really want to go deeper here. I want to understand the nature of vibration and what it's telling us about who we are as human beings and our power to heal. And I found that there was just this dearth of research, this dearth of inquiry in the energy healing practices, and yet I couldn't deny their power to affect change and positive change in patients. And I said, yeah. we really need to be looking in this direction. So that's really what set me on the path of doing my own research in energy healing therapies, and then eventually creating the consciousness and healing initiative so we could scare, scale this knowing more broadly for humanity to bring this missing link of energy back into the picture of putting it back into really what I believe should really be more of a central focus of understanding how our subtle awareness can help foster healing. So that's pretty much the story.
I titled this episode True Resonance because that's the core of all creation, including our existence and the literal bottom line. When we keep zooming in with the most powerful microscopes into subatomic particles, the final frontier we can reach at this time at least is simply vibrating quanta of energy. So everything vibrates at its specific frequency. And I would like to frame our conversation within this concept as we talk about different issues within it, because I want to embed this understanding in people's minds when they listen to this podcast. And I drive this point in every interview I can, because it is so fundamental to our understanding of how life really works. So let's stay with the broader perspective before we move on to some level of detail. How quantum entanglement, Eastern esoteric teachings, and neuroscience fit together, in your view, bridging science and spirituality in the understanding of how life works that they give us? Because this is almost like a triangle, not even dichotomy, but a triangle. So we have quantum science, esoteric teachings, and neuroscience which I think is fascinating. Could you just give us a a sense of how do they all fit together at this intersection of science and spirituality? Yeah, beautiful question. And and I want to stress that I am not a physicist. I do not pretend to be a physicist (laughs) at all. So when I look at these three aspects that you mentioned, I think of them more as how we explain what we're experiencing and observing both through the scientific method and through our own personal healing experiences as an example. Um, So there is a rootedness in the discussion based on science for sure, but there are a lot of holes to fill. Okay. And when we're talking about it from a pure physics standpoint, or even putting together all of the pieces to, to bring them together. And yet we're we're on the precipice of understanding even more and more about how these things scientifically link together. So first let's start with what do we know about entanglement really? And I'm going to speak again from my point Mm -hmm. as a clinical psychologist and researcher in psychoneuroimmunology, very different field than quantum physics. And as I mentioned in my book, Anna, you know, when I was young and people would say, oh, entanglement, I would go, oh, there we go, the hand waving, you know, rolling of the eyes, we, everything is entanglement. But the truth is, it's probably, to my understanding, um, the most complete way of describing what we're beginning to see. And so what do we know about entanglement? First of all, what is it? It is, it is an understanding that things are connected even across time, potentially, and definitely space. Okay, so we have had dozens and dozens, hundreds and hundreds of studies showing this on the micro level, right? When we look at atoms, we can see that atoms can be separated, you know, across the world and still have this behavior where they can spin together, they spin complementarily. Um, We can even send, you know, atoms, if you will, to outer space and see the, the entanglement with atoms here in, in, uh, in, (laughs) on earth. So we understand that on the micro level, now on the macro level, you know, the the argument has always been, well, you guys want to use entanglement to explain some of these spooky things that happen. But, you know, now we're talking about biological systems and big systems and, you know, there's no evidence. Well, now there's growing evidence for what we call entanglement-like behavior, even in biological systems, including in plants, including in, 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 in fish, in other animals, um, and in other ways. We also now, as we begin to explore things like the behavior of animals in homing, you know, using the magnetic uh, receptors that are available for birds and in other animals, it seems that we could explain their behavior and the movement of biology, literally the movement of ions through those channels from an entanglement-like perspective. I like to think of entanglement as a perspective for most of us. I think that's an easier way to say it. We don't have all of the data to fit in to say distant healing definitely happens through entanglement. But the truth is we don't have a better explanation (laughs) than that right now. And we have growing bodies of evidence to suggest that entanglement-like behavior is happening across biological systems, including these macro systems, meaning living beings, right, in 
these plants and animals. So we're seeing evidence for this entanglement-like behavior. What does it mean? How does it work? Well, fundamentally, this does link to ancient teachings because the ancient teachings have always said first, fundamentally, we're connected. We're connected through a field. Now, as you know, many of our fellow scientists use this term biofield, which is you know part of the book that I wrote called Biofield Science and the Future of Health. What does it mean? Biofields is really what it is. It's plural because they are fields of energy and information that connect us and heal us. We use the fancier terms, fields of energy and information, including but not necessarily only electromagnetic fields of energy and information that guide the homeodynamic functioning of a living organism. What does this mean? We are nurtured and supported and we are fields of energy and information. Now, in my traditions, in the East Indian traditions, as you know, we talked about the Akashic records, the idea that the information has always been here. It exists. We are actually in the sea of energy and information constantly. But it's our filtering. It's our actually our identification with what we might call the egoic state, the conditioned mind, however we want to describe it. So if I identify as Shamini Jan, this person, the wife, the mother, the scientist, the writer, the this, the that, and and I'm identifying with this way of being in the world in this personified way, and then I identify even more with my previous patterns of ancestral trauma and my triggers and, you know, my emotions. And if, if I'm purely identified, mostly in my waking consciousness with this, nothing wrong with it, okay? We're, in, we're embodied for a reason. But I may be filtering in a way that I don't have full access to all the energy and information that is out there. So in our ancient traditions, when we talk about enlightenment, when we talk about connecting with the all-knowing, all-being, all-blissful state of who we are, we are talking about being, if you will, (laughs) fully entangled with all the energy and information that is present in the present moment. So there's so many ways, as you know, that we've talked about this in numerous spiritual traditions. I'm more familiar with the East Indian ones, so that's what I typically talk about. What is the power of mindfulness? What is the, what is the point of present moment awareness? If we are stuck in our conditioning, we become stuck in the present. I mean, rather we get stuck in the past, we get stuck in the future. Why? Because we're stuck in the conditioning. When we are fully engaged in the present moment, All of these fields of energy and information become more freely available for us to parse through our minds. The mind is now the servant, if you will, of the present moment versus a slave to the ego. And when we relate this to healing, both self-healing and facilitating healing for others, I believe that this is what we're Mm. going on. So we, we can think of these karmic clouds, if you will, of conditioning that are always floating across our souls, you know, so now I'm again waxing more in in the spiritual realm. So here's where we are. We, you know, we're embodied, we're conditioned, we carry history with us, both our own personal history of this life, previous life, our ancestral lives, our ancestral lineage, all of this information is available to us. And then there's information that's even beyond this more personal experience. So as we deepen our contemplative practice, we begin to access even deeper realms of information. As we do our healing practice, we allow for a stilling of these clouds for a certain amount of time so that we can be a better conduit for the energy and information that can come through us touch into another being across time and space and facilitate their connection to this all, to the big B biofield, if you will. So this is how I personally parse it. And as you can tell, I tend to lean more in the spiritual tradition um, and the explanations of it because I feel like that knowledge is, has really been there across millennia. And so it may be up to us, you know, in the empirical sciences to explain it through empirical science to expand our knowledge of physics beyond the Newtonian Cartesian dynamic that has been sort of guiding the way that we see the world. 
if I were to be, you know, conservative, I would say Newtonian Cartesian way of thinking is incomplete. It doesn't mean we throw it out. It helps to explain certain phenomena, but it explains the phenomena in the conditioned realm, not in more expanded consciousness realms. Yes, beautifully said. And as it usually happens, we have certain knowledge that serves us up to a point, a point at which we can expand our understanding and we are ready to expand our understanding and enhance the those concepts beyond what is known at the time. So obviously Newtonian physics, physics came first, now we have quantum physics, and who knows what's next? There, there might be completely new and completely different and, and even more bizarre, if you like, <laughs> a concept of the forces that we call life. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Just to, to touch on this point once more, I think, for us as human beings kind of considering, many people are considering, what is the truth? What can I really rest my trust in? And the interesting thing about quantum physics is it's leading us to this paradox of how science has been done, what we call first person versus third person methodology. There has been this thought in science that I can kind of observe from the outside and I can do replicable studies that will tell me about the truth of a phenomena. But quantum physics really turns that on its head because what we realize is when we really delve into the research, the empirical research in quantum physics, you cannot separate the observer from the observed. And this is very important to us in our lives because what it means is we are actually creating our reality. So we must allow for that quietude, you know, that dropping into pure awareness beyond conditioning to allow for the realm of possibilities to show itself more freely to us. If we go in, you know, I was talking with a gentleman who's going through a hard time, as many people are, lost his mother, recent divorce, and, you know, is sort of in a my life sucks area right now, right? He's a typical person, you know, kind of walking down the street, isn't waxing about quantum physics or energy medicine or whatever, lovely human being, spiritual person, but doesn't necessarily think in these realms. And so I was explaining to him how, yes, it feels like that right now, and it's fine that it feels like that right now, but you want to open to the joy of life as well as the suffering. Because if you only align with the suffering, then all you see is suffering and all you experience is suffering. But if you can allow yourself to open even to a little joy, even within the suffering, then you open the field to the broader possibilities of what is here without bypass. You don't have to bypass. You don't have to pretend that suffering doesn't exist or that your suffering isn't real. But you can also open to the joy just so you expand those possibilities for yourself even more. So you don't dig yourself into a hole. This is really important for our mental health. Absolutely. And thank you very much for saying this. You see, in my own work and in my certainly in my uh, interviews on my podcast, my key objective is not to just talk about those high-level scientific or even spiritual concepts, because yes, it's interesting, it's it's fun to talk about it, but my whole point is, how can we use those concepts in our daily life to improve our our life experience? So I always like to bring those both scientific and esoteric and spiritual concepts to the practical level, because that's what people want. And not everyone, obviously, can understand quantum physics at, at its scientific level, but we can bring those concepts that we can explain in a way that most people will understand. Watch your thoughts and your emotions. Why? Because you are sending that energy to the quantum field and people pick it up and things happen and things change. So thank you for pointing this out. And by the way, I love your term karmic cloud. <laughs> <It's> just, 
I I really really love it, and it um, just reminds me of something. But that that would be a separate conversation. Now there are many different schools of thought about what is a biofield and what is consciousness, and I mean with both big and small B and C. And some people use these terms interchangeably. What is your definition and description? And does it come from the Eastern tradition or quantum physics or both? Beautiful question. I would say, to be honest, it comes more from my spiritual tradition and the, and really my own exploration of the spiritual traditions. As, as I mentioned, I was born and raised in the tradition of Jainism, our biggest um, tenet that we are mostly known for is nonviolence or ahimsa. And uh, it is not considered a theistic type of religion where one, for example, prays to gods. Um, God is within you. Really, that's the understanding. So again, the, the idea of big C consciousness from the Jan perspective is that we are that, similar to Vedanta and other traditions. And so these so-called karmic clouds, we actually describe, Jainism describes as being very real. So Jans, Jans believe in karma as being a real thing. And this is relevant to our conversation about big C and little c consciousness and big B and little b biofield. From the Jan tradition, we are big C consciousness. We believe in the existence of a soul. Now there's, you know, quibblings on metaphysics between Vedanta and Jainism. Vedanta talks about Brahman being the all um, you know, that is big C consciousness, really. That is Satchit Anand, our pure state of awareness, being in bliss. Jans describe it similarly. We just believe in the individualized soul. These are all quibblings on metaphysics. And honestly, I don't pay them much attention <laughs> because to me, it's not as personally relevant to me because I have far a far way to go before I worry, worry about whether my soul is individual or collective. That's <laughs> sort of a moot point at this point. It's all semantics to me. Um, but what is very real in these traditions is, again, big C consciousness being our unencumbered, fully enlightened self or selves, if you will. What keeps us from being in contact with the big C consciousness is, again, our conditioning, these karmic clouds. In Jainism, we talk about them as a karmic body. Literally, you could think of it as a field of energy information that stores everything that we have thought, everything that we do, everything that we feel. So thoughts, words, and deeds are basically what create karmic residues, right? And this is because we live in the conditioned world. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, and here I will draw from more of the tantric traditions in my description of the relationship of the big B biofield to big C consciousness, one of the ways this has been described in tantric traditions is big C consciousness being described as the Shiva principle. And I will call it the principle here. These understandings were later personified into deities. So Shiva, I mean, people will re recognize as a god, right? Shiva is depicted as a god. Interestingly, Shiva is depicted as both masculine and feminine. There are masculine and feminine aspects to Shiva. But what is Shiva really? Shiva is pure, unadulterated consciousness that is actually still and ever pervading. So in these traditions, there are these beautiful stories. And of course, Shiva is personified as a god. And Shiva is meditating in the mountain in pure, unadulterated consciousness, presence, and bliss. And along comes Shakti, which could be personified as the big B biofield. Now, what is Shakti? Shakti is the manifest power behind the entire universe. Shakti, in this case, is what brings consciousness into form through what we have been calling energy, and I would call the biofield. So in these beautiful stories, Shakti is personified as a beautiful goddess, Parvati in this case, who you know reaches out to Shiva and entices him through what? The experience of desire to create the entire universe. And so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in these teachings and these stories because essentially what they are describing is Big B biofield as the energy that powers consciousness in form in this great world, this universe that we live in. And let's just focus on the earth. What does it mean? It means that the tree that I'm looking out, out the window right now in front of me, you, me, the bugs outside, my dog, every living thing is consciousness in form. 
it is big C and big B, big C consciousness and big B biofield now instantiated into what we might call a little C consciousness and a little C biofield. Consciousness in form, personified, embodied, and yet all part of the same fabric, right? All part of the same, the same unified consciousness and energy expressed in all of these beautiful ways. So in the spiritual traditions, what this means is we're not separate, first of all. That's number one. This is why I can contemplate by simply enjoying the bird song outside or observing the birds or watching the bugs do as, as they do and really be with them and experience an expanded state of consciousness just through that pure awareness and observation because I come to recognize that I'm not separate from that which I'm observing because we are part of the same fabric. So this is how we understand big C and little c consciousness, big B biofield, little b biofield. Now what's beautiful about this and why I like the biofield aspect of it is one of the ways that we can access the purity of consciousness is through connecting with the fields of energy and information to expand our awareness. And this is what the healing practices teach us. This is how we can use pranayam, the working of life force energy through our bodies to expand our sense of the biofield and come into greater consciousness, greater resonance, as you term this, this uh, discussion here, right? With larger aspects of consciousness beyond just the I, me, mine of embodied conditioned consciousness at times. So I, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. And this is the most beautiful explanation I have ever heard. Beautifully explained and what a beautiful, beautiful narrative. So thank you. And this is a very nice segue to my next question. So continuing on the topic of consciousness, a bit of a curiosity question, which also links, by the way, to neuroscience, <laughs> interestingly. One of the most controversial topics in the narrative of consciousness is organ transplant. We know that the energy of the donor is in incorporated in the body of the recipient, obviously. Often their tastes and preferences change, their personality might even change, especially in heart transplants, all of which has been well documented. But this could be just through the physical DNA. Now, what I'm curious about, and I often wonder, <laughs> whether the donor's consciousness is also implanted. And this could be tested, I think, uh, only uh, in cases of, say, kidney transplant when the donor is still alive because they have the remaining kidney and could report a sense of expanded consci consciousness, if you like, through the recipient and beyond, and maybe even feeling uh, some sort of a sense of a strong energetic connection with the recipient and through them. So I find this question really fascinating and would love to hear your view on this, perhaps informed again by your ancient uh, Indian spiritualism. And also, are you aware of any such research being done on consciousness in medical transplants or reports from kidney donors who suddenly feel this really strong connection with the recipient. You know, Paul I think it was Dr. Paul Pearsall who wrote a book called The Heart's Code, if I believe that's the name of it, and, you know, cataloging as a physician these experiences of heart transplant patients and their recollections of um, their knowing, basically, of things that only the, the donor had experienced in their life. So that, and there are a few scientists who have been looking at this, you know, more in this organ transplant way, whether kidney, I don't know, but fascinating. And yeah, it could be really interesting, for example, to do entanglement like studies where would there be a way to stimulate the kidney, for example, of the donor and see whether there would be a sympathetic response in the recipient of yeah. the, that would be absolutely fascinating to explore. And I think your question about is how is there and how is there an instantiation of the, the donor's consciousness in that organ 
absolutely fascinating to consider. Well, in the spiritual traditions, you know, I, I, if, if some people may be familiar with the work and the teachings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they were spiritual teachers in the um, in the nineteenth, you know, uh, in the twentieth century, rather in the nineteen hundreds. Now they have passed, um, but very their teachings um, absolutely live on in the community. So their ashram is in Pondicherry, India. If anyone has ever been to Oroville, um, just an amazing place. Um, so their teachings and their spirit definitely live on. One of the things that the mother described during all of her spiritual awakenings that she had in her embodied life. She spoke much about the consciousness of cells. And one of the things that she said was that we're in a very unique time as human beings right now where we can bring the divine fully into physical form. And she believed that that happened absolutely all the way to the cellular level. So she was literally talking about bringing divine energy all the way into our cells. What do we know currently, you know, scientifically? We absolutely know that our thoughts change our biochemistry. You know, we we're understanding now from the biofield point of view how the consciousness of a of a trained healer can actually influence the um, spread of tumors in the body that is reduce the tumor spread in the body. And these are carefully controlled studies with mice done at MD Anderson down to cell signaling levels. So we know that consciousness and it seems energy does have an effect all the way on the cellular level. We don't talk much about cellular memory in that way. From the spiritual perspective, and this is just my own musing, I would wonder whether a connection with a living organ, organ from a previous life would allow better contact of that disembodied spirit or wherever that spirit goes. Say, say, for example, I'm in this body and I decide to donate my heart to someone and then I leave this body, you know, my consciousness is now beyond this body, mm -hmm. but my heart is still living. Would I have a way of communicating even more strongly through the biology because of that? Because there is an entanglement because I've had this heart for so many years. It was so, my second question, by the way. <laughs> if, if one is, you know, inclined to the spiritual, then it would make sense. Yeah. Is there any data behind it? I don't think so. You know, um, although there are some wonderful, you know, frontier researchers that have been exploring spirit communication now for decades. Um, so the, it's absolutely plausible. I think it would be really neat to do entanglement studies with living donors and recipients, say with the kidneys is a great example because there's two of them to just yeah. explore what that would be like. And there is some grounding to that, even with distant intention research, for example, with people having very different organs, but just being able to connect across space with someone sending distant intention to a receiver and a receiver literally physiologically receiving that through indications of skin conductance and heart rate. So again, there is some impetus for this idea of this distant communication. And there's really so much we don't know scientifically still. Yes, absolutely. So what about the placebo effect and how can we use it outside of healing? Does our belief change our biofield? And I believe that you may have touched upon this. Is it similar to homeopathy, which uses pure energy imprint rather than molecular structure to affect the body and mind? There's so much to this question. And my dear friend and colleague, Bill Bankston, and I have had lively conversations about this. For those who don't know Bill Bankston, you know, seminal researcher and, and, and practitioner in biofield science and healing. Um, we both feel, as I think most of us feel at this point, that placebo in the way that we describe it is grossly misunderstood. Placebo itself, as I say in my book, is a misnomer. Placebo equals heal. What does that mean? We know that these so-called placebo effects we see in, sure, in acupuncture and in holistic therapies, but we also see it with drugs substantially. 75% of the effects of antidepressants on depression are known to be caused by what we call placebo factors and natural history effects. We see placebo effects robustly in surgery, across surgeries. I detail all of this in the book, of course. So we see it in every healing encounter. What does it mean? What makes up a placebo effect? Well, part of it is the conscious mind. 
And the way we see that is through what we call expectation, belief. That's what most of us typically think about when we think about a placebo effect. So how much do I believe that this particular healing therapy is working for me or not working in the case of nocebo effects where we actually can create a negative effect just by believing there will be a negative effect? So that's conscious mind mostly with you know subconscious drivers to it. But then when we look in these other aspects of placebo that are incredibly powerful and absolutely in substantiated by lots of studies, dozens and dozens of studies, we find that what we call conditioning, my body-mind response, which is somewhat subconscious, if I had a wonderful experience with a Reiki session with a particular healing practitioner, the chances are my body-mind is going to go into a relaxation state the minute I step into the door next time. That's a conditioned response. It's what we call related to learning, conscious and subconscious. Relationship, how much I feel like I can trust my doctor or that they have my back and that they believe in my healing, um, that they're here to help me, absolutely calms my nervous system, shifts my immune system into a different state of being altogether. That's absolutely powerful and part of the placebo effect. Ritual, huge driver of placebo effects, and one that's not often talked about but has been known in indigenous spiritual and healing circles for millennia. From the spiritual traditions, ritual is meant to open the field of consciousness up to have allowing spirit to help guide the healing process. That is how the ancient traditions understood the power of ritual. In the scientific realm, we talk about it more as set and setting. We look at it more from the behavioral level. We talk about things like white coat hypertension, which is almost the ritual that leads to a nocebo effect where I see a doctor come in in a white coat and my heart rate goes up because I get nervous. He's going to give me bad news. Well, that's ritual. That's set and setting, right? So all these things we can actually work with to facilitate our healing. Now that we know what those elements are, holistic elements that activate life force or heal. That's the way I describe them. And I outline them all in my book with sort of a step-by-step -step process of how we can utilize those for our healing. What does it tell us about the nature of placebo? All these studies we've been doing are completely wrong, where we're trying to compare what we think is the treatment, a drug or acupuncture or whatever, surgery, to so-called placebo, which is not the healing element. Well, no, placebo is a huge driver of, of elements. So what this means is that it's a both and. Placebo, in a way, you can think about it when you explore it from an entanglement lens, means placebo is allowing for deeper entanglement to happen. That's what I believe is actually happening. I've been waiting for this word, entanglement, because this is what it all comes down to. Yes, and this yeah. is what Bill and I have been talking about, and it's absolutely related to resonance. Placebo elements allow us to more deeply open the field of consciousness, expand the fields of energy and information available to us for our healing. So we have to completely reframe what we are calling placebo because what we're doing is utilizing these natural elements to expand our consciousness and deepen the healing effects. So there is some power behind acupuncture or certain medicines. It's not that they do nothing. It's just that we've had it totally flipped. We think that that's, those are the singular active ingredient. And so it's not, it's, it's an embedded system. Mm. It's an embedded system. And so the placebo aspects are very powerful to help embed us in the healing context. So what would you call it if not placebo? I call it HEAL, holistic elements that activate life force. Because these are elements that we see across all types of healing practices, whether they're so-called allopathic practices like drugs and surgery, or holistic practices like acupuncture, energy healing, herbal medicine, and whatever. It's ubiquitous. It just exists. So these are healing elements that activate life force. Mm, absolutely. My favorite quote from Alice in Wonderland is by the Mad Hatter. Dreams are not reality, but who's to say which is which? What are your thoughts on this conundrum? Dream, reality. Dream, reality. Yeah. 
a beautiful, beautiful question. It's mind boggling to sit in. For some people, it's disturbing, especially if we're dealing with mental health afflictions. And I think when we sit with this truth that the Mad Hatter um, gave us, it is to remember that we have the power to create our experience in this world, whether we consider this world illusory or not. Again, many traditions describing this as different. We talked about Shiva and Shakti, the nature of consciousness and the instantiation of it into physical form. From the Vedantic perspective, this entire world is illusion. The entire world is illusion. This is the dream. We, our, our goal is to wake up from the dream. What does that mean? What does waking up from the dream mean? It means not identifying with the illusion of separation, not identifying with the illusion of um, a littler sea consciousness and losing the forest for the trees, if that makes sense. So what I like about it, and I think how we can frame this, because there is a way to frame this where one can, I'm going to be honest, there is a way to frame that statement in a way that can lead to great despair. Nothing matters. Everything is an illusion. So nothing I do matters. What is this world anyway? I have no idea, but I'm suffering greatly and I see suffering all around me. This can lead to great despair. It can lead to us questioning everything that we know about who we are, our relationships, the nature of life, the purpose of life and question the meaning of it all. And that is in its in and of itself a deep spiritual path, <laughs> right? It really is. It can lead to nihilism, it can lead to atheism. Atheism, in my view, isn't necessarily non-spiritual, right? Um, but for some people, especially if we're struggling with depression and anxiety and trauma, this can lead us into a place that really isn't optimal for our growth. So we need to be careful if we decide to take this sort of path into inquiring about the nature of reality and the nature of illusion. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you. But I would like to take this into a slightly different direction. When we go to sleep, when we are asleep, our consciousness goes somewhere else. So this is one of my really uh, strong areas of interest, which I am researching in, in my own work. Where does our consciousness go? And what comes to mind is the movie Avatar, which is one of my favorite movies. And interestingly, this particular movie has made a very strange impact on millions of people to the point of hysterics and emotional disturbances. And people were wondering why. Because I believe personally that it contains the truth, or at least part of the truth, of where does our consciousness go when we essentially are losing our awareness of being. So in the movie Avatar, we could see the, that the person lived in two worlds. And when he went to sleep in one world, he would wake up in another world. And then so he was alternating between the two worlds. What are your thoughts on this aspect of the Mad Hatter's uh, quote or truth or, <laughs> a, or, or invitation to, to think about it? Where does our consciousness go? When, when we are asleep for seven, eight hours every single day and we cannot not sleep, we cannot keep on going and keep on living without actually going to sleep. Where does our consciousness go? Yeah, beautiful. It's interesting because, you know, there are contemplative practitioners who find that, you know, through their meditative practices, they have decreased need for sleep because there's a quiescence in the body when they sit in meditation. So from the biological, physical perspective, we know that sleep helps us repair our immune system. The parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, helps for cellular repair. And this is one of the biological reasons why we sleep. And from the psychological perspective, of course, what you're saying is very important. And most of us listening to this may be familiar to some degree with the works of Carl Jung. 
and the descriptions of consciousness that he put forth in his teachings and writings. The understanding of, of course, not just the conscious mind and the subconscious, but the collective unconscious. And in the dream state, we have greater access to these aspects of consciousness. Now, different Western psychologists have described this differently. We know about the work of Freud, you know, uncontrolled impulses, we keep them down. And that's mostly the way he describes the subconscious. We're working, dreams are a way of us working out the subconscious. And there's some truth to that. You know, some of us have had those anxiety dreams of, oh, there's a history test from grade school that I'm afraid (laughs) of, right? So there's some, but there's another aspect where many of us feel like we're traveling. We're talking with people. We're doing healing work in the astral realms. And the the spiritual and psychological traditions have talked about these different realms of being. And in the healing traditions, we understand this, even in the waking consciousness that we may astrally travel to facilitate healing for ourselves or someone else, to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge. So the dream state allows, you know, from these perspectives and experiences for us to safely detach from the body for a time and gain information, insights, help others, and then come back into the body. So it is an exploration and a journeying of consciousness that happens. Now, the question of whether these are reality any more than our waking consciousness is, you know, is reality is a very deep question. Perhaps all of it is illusion. And, you know, it's, I would love to have these conversations with the meditators who have found the decreased need for sleep to see what their experiences is when they're sitting. Are they journeying, for example, on the astral level and just more cognizant of it? The lucid dream while not even dreaming, so to speak. But it's pointing to all of these facets of our experience as human beings exploring consciousness from these different vantage points, from the waking, from the dream state, and from meditative states, right? That all of these are states of consciousness. And it does sort of fly in the face of the idea that the only the only instantiation of consciousness is in the physical form if you know because these experiences show us that well we we are experiencing things um that are valuable to our soul's growth um and even to our daily physical lives when we are sleeping so is that any less real than you know me walking around and doing the dishes depends on my perspective Yes, well, this is a most fascinating topic, and I, um, I wish we had more time to, uh, to talk about it. But time is catching up with us. So at this point, could you please tell us more about the Chi, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, also your book, Healing Ourselves, and I will include all the links in the show notes, obviously, for people to access this information about your work, courses, and offerings. So just in a nutshell, so that people know how to contact you and how they might engage with you. Yeah, great. Well, happy to. I do a lot of teaching. Um, I teach at a couple of retreat centers fairly regularly that are just beautiful places. I'll be doing a program at Esalen Institute in Big Sur um, in September. So encourage folks to do come to that. I'm teaching in some sound healing retreats this summer also. And we have a beautiful program for anyone who feels called to do this. There's a beautiful program that I'm a part of in the Maldives in October on wellness um, and a beautiful, beautiful eco-sustainable resort that is a fundraiser for environmental sustainability. So I love the live teaching. I also do some online live teaching. I'll be teaching soon again with um, my my dear colleagues at the Shift Network um, on Voicing the Goddess, and it's a journey into the divine feminine and sound, which is a big part of what I do. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but sound is an access point for us, all of what we've been talking about, connecting with the field, connecting with the biofield and expanding our consciousness through contact with divine energies, through divine sound making. So it's a lot of what I teach in my in-person and online courses. And um, if you go to my website, shamanijan.com, you'll learn more about those sort of events and teachings. And there's a lot of resources there as well, the book. And I'm I'm thrilled to have received two awards for that book um, from Nautilus and also an upcoming award for that book um, with Sounds True Publications. So that's just been a great honor. The book is 
is um, one part of it is really exploring the ancient science, the empirical science, and then the practicality. So the third part of the book is called The Healing Keys, and it's really putting it into practice. So I encourage people to check out the book. It's also available on audiobook, I think, by Audible, or you can find it anywhere books are sold. I highly encourage people to connect with us at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. We are a social profit collaborative. We do a lot of wonderful work with our community of really wonderful healing teachers, scientists, sort of sharing the latest science and the practices more broadly as a community. Um, and it's totally free. You just sign up at chi.is or chi.is. And that'll link you into all of the good things that are happening, the latest science, great events. Um, we have historically been doing weekly or rather monthly free webinars for the public, which we hope to re um, engage with very soon this year, where you can really meet a lot of the leading lights in the field. And it's just a beautiful community. We have, it's a really, we have an international community of people at this point. So um, really encourage people to con connect in with Qi and um, utilize all of the resources available. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And so once again, I will include all the links in the show notes. And my final question, what is your vision for humanity and how we can or how we, we could get there? Once we realize that we really are creating this world and we come into the joy of our conscious creation, we have the power to create, as my dear friend Bruce Lipton likes to say, heaven on earth. And this is my vision for us, that, that we see the and experience the interconnection of all life, that we honor and revere the life force within us and between us so that we can live in the Garden of Eden, so to speak, this beautiful world that we have been given and enjoy it. Enjoy our time here together. Enjoy our human evolution and be responsible stewards of our planet. And I know that I'm not alone in this vision. I think we all in our hearts deeply know that this is possible, this is true. And we all have this deep desire in our hearts to manifest it. So let's do it. It's time. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Well, I wish we had more time. <laughs> Perhaps we could uh, do it again, <laughs> part two, at some point, because there is still so much to, to talk about in this field Thank you so much, Shemini. I really appreciate your beautiful presence. And it's such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's been my pleasure too. And thank you to everyone who has been listening. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then... Keep your vibrations high and be well.